Notice that on this theory of error, it's not the case that we hate the horrific suffering we see more than it should be hated. Perhaps we see, perhaps we see only part of its hatefulness and don't hate it as much as it deserves to be hated. Maybe we aren't even capable of that. Nor is it the case on this theory of error that God doesn't care about the horrific suffering we see and hate. God, if he exists, hates it as it deserves to be hated, which might be far more than we are capable of comprehending. It's not our hatred of it that is misguided. It's our ranking of its despicableness. Because we can't take in horrors much worse than these, we are tempted to think they are the most despicable or close to it. As a result, we are tempted to think a perfectly loving God couldn't be motivated to permit them. But it may be, for all we know, that God, although God hates them even more than we do, he hates other things to a far greater degree, things we simply can't hate as they deserve to be hated because we can't comprehend how horrific they are. In that case, the horrific sufferings we know of, though they may be more despicable than we think they are, would be ranked fairly low in terms of despicableness when compared with the other more hateful things God considers. And if those other more hateful things couldn't be prevented without permitting the horrors we see, or things as bad or worse, then it would make sense for a loving God to permit the horrors we see, just as the loving parent permits her child to undergo cancer treatment, because that's the only way the parent knows of to avoid the worst evils associated with death by cancer. Moreover, if all of this were so and we were enabled to have God's perspective on the matter, we ourselves would wholeheartedly affirm God's choice to permit the horrors we see around us. Given ST1 through ST4, these epistemic possibilities are things we have no good reason to think are even unlikely if God exists. An atheist or agnostic, an agnostic could easily admit as much. Okay, let's skip to uh, page 17 in the booklet if you're reading along for section four. So I'm going to close with a challenge to opponents of the skeptical theist's skepticism. One thing opponents of the skeptical theist's skepticism rarely do is acknowledge the plausibility of ST1 through ST4. This is a problem for them. For independently of theism, ST1 through ST4 seem highly plausible. Moreover, ST1 through ST4 seem to imply that we cannot reasonably infer the second of these two claims from the first. We can't infer from this premise for some actual evils we know of. We can't think of any God justifying reason for permitting them. We can't infer from that that probably there aren't any God justifying reasons for permitting those evils. What opponents of the skeptical theist skepticism typically try to do is show how the skepticism embodied in ST1 through ST4 commits one to some other unpalatable skepticism. But those who support the skeptical theist skepticism, whether theists or non-theists, keep coming back to the fact that the following two claims seem highly plausible. First, that ST1 through ST4 are true. And secondly, if ST1 through ST4 are true, then the inference from one to two, just mentioned above, is not a good inference. I find that whenever I read objections to the skeptical theist skepticism, I can't get around the extreme plausibility of A and B. Given that, I'm very doubtful that the implausible skepticism supposedly implied by the skeptical theist skepticism really is implied by it. My challenge then to opponents of the skeptical theist skepticism is first to help those who endorse it to see what's wrong with A or B, and second to explain why A and B seem true if they aren't. This is something I have not seen attempted in the literature. Instead, Objectors merely argue that the implausible skepticism, sorry, that implausible skepticism of some sort follows from the skeptical theist's skepticism. Taking up this challenge persuasively would, I think, go a long way toward bringing an end to support for the skeptical theist's skepticism. is Steve Weikstra. My paper is called The End of Skeptical Theism. <laughs> Steve Weikstra uh, conveys his apologies. He started this paper, saw the line of argument to be pursued, but could not bear to carry it through. He asked me, his twin brother, to do this for him. My name is Artsky, 
Artsky W. Evitz. This isn't the first time my brother Steve has asked me to do his dirty work for him. Um, there's copies of my paper in the back, and on the last page you'll see a letter from Alvin Plandinga to my brother Steve Weikstra, dated March 2nd, 1994. It says, uh, be, Dear Steve, thank you for your letter and the Evitz paper. On rereading what I said, this was in Reason and Belief in God, I think Evitz is right. And then the next paragraph says, I don't know why I wrote that section in such a confusing way, unless it was that when I wrote it, I didn't really have a clear grasp of the difference between objective and subjective duty. Cheers, Alvin Plandiga. So, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. Michael Bergman thinks there's no real tension between common sense moral knowledge and skeptical theism. Any appearance of tension is misleading, he thinks, and easily dispelled. I'll argue that the two are in deep conflict and that Michael's M defense doesn't show otherwise. Skeptical theism aims to diffuse, diffuse Roe-style no CM arguments. We see no God justifying good for allowing some evil E, so probably there be no God justifying good for it. Skeptical theists retort that seeing no such good isn't good evidence for there being none. This is because if God exists, it follows that there are such goods for every evil God allows, but it also follows that God's mind being far greater than ours, it wouldn't be surprising if the goods are ones we can't see or even imagine. Bergman distinguishes skeptical theism's skepticism from its theism. Its skepticism includes these four skeptical theses. We've no good reason for thinking that first. The possible goods we know of are representative of the possible goods there are. The entailment relations we know of are representative of the entailments relations they are. The total moral value we perceive accurate, accurately reflects their actual total moral value. We've no good reason for thinking any of these are true. That's the skepticism part. No good reason for thinking these are true. Bergman here uses the phrase no reason for thinking in what I'll call its enthusiastic sense, embracing radical ignorance about likelihoods. He thus has the skeptic affirm that she, the skeptic, has no idea how likely it is that the possible goods, evils, and entailments between them that she knows of are representative of the possible goods, evils, and entailments between them that are actually there. So why might someone see a tension with moral common sense here? Bergman says, it will help to focus on an imagined non-theist common senses named Sally, who's an agnostic and yet endorses the skeptical theist's skeptical thesis, theses, ST1 through ST4. Sally is meant to illustrate an instance uh, of common sense moral knowing that Bergman describes thusly. Perhaps Sally claims to know of some act that it would be morally wrong to perform for her to perform it. Her main reason for thinking the act would be wrong is that she can see that the immediate result of the action would be enormous harm to a child, and she has no reason for thinking any significant good would come of the action. The flip side works equally well, of course. If Sally sees that one result of A would be an enormous good for the child and has no reason for thinking any significant harm will come of it, she's in a good position to know doing A is right. Bergman has this knowing, this type of moral knowing, supervene on consequential reasoning. It will prove handy to have a non-moral analog. Suppose that Alvin Plandinga, to mark entering his golden years, has purchased a Corvette. It is now misfiring because the spark plug points are fouled. Like all true Dutchmen, Al buys the cheapest gas he can. <laughs> but he's found a mixture that added to the gas a few times is known to burn carbon off the points. Big Al thus has good reason to think that using this mixture will bring a great good for his Corvette. Moreover, he has no reason for thinking any significant harm will come of using the mixture. He's thus in a good position to know that adding the mixture is the right thing to do. But Sally also embraces ST1 through 4. Bergman's description nicely brings out her enthusiasm. 
but perhaps because of ST1 through ST4, she also thinks that she has no idea how likely it is that the consequences of the act would in the long